Hi there. I thought to do a series on this book, The Three Worlds, The Plan of Redemption. This is the book published by Nelson Barber and Charles Taze Russell in 1877. It's majority of it is the work of Nelson Barber, but in as much as Charles Russell is his collaborator and his colleague and obviously endorses everything that's in this book, you can begin to see as we work through the material in this book, published in 1877, the roots of Watchtower theology and thinking. Many of the ideas that are in this book are still with us in Jehovah's Witnesses theology today. So I thought we'd plunge right in, but not before showing you this table. And inscribed, inscribed on the table are write the vision and make it plain on tables. A classic misapplication by the Watchtower of a biblical text. But on the table, if you look at it closely, are the dates, 1872, 1874, 1878, and 1914. So the chronology of the Watchtower is, it, its original chronology, that is, up until at least Rutherford's day, is laid out for us in this book, primarily by the Adventist Nelson Barber. The, the official title on the title page is Three Worlds and the Harvest of This World. The central controlling concept of the book is that we're in the seventh judgment, the seventh trumpet period of the book of Revelation. And that trumpet period will last until... 1914. So here we plunge into chapter 1, the three worlds and plan of redemption. A fourth world, or a fourth heaven, is nowhere named in the Bible or associated with the past, present, or future of man. But three heavens and three earths are distinctly mentioned. And in order to understand the language of Scripture, these three worlds must be recognized. Not the heaven, earth, and hell of the catechism, but the world that was before the flood, this present evil world, and the world to come. And all that is all that God has revealed of man or his destiny is associated with one or more of these worlds. And they follow each other. That is, no two exist at one and the same time. Hence the Bible is a progressive science. If the above is true, the whole of Revelation, then when properly handled, will arrange itself into one grand system by revelation here. Of course, he doesn't mean the book of Revelation, but rather the 66 books of the Bible. And the details, instead of being a confused math, mass of facts, commandments, and promises, will prove susceptible of perfect organization, every part taking its true place. If one would but admit the truth of the above, and it is sustained from Genesis to Revelation, much of the obscurity connected with the plan of salvation would vanish, and harmony exist among the many apparently conflicting texts of Scripture. Each of these three worlds is spoken of in 2 Peter, the third chapter, as a distinct heavens and earth. The heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was then was being overflowed with water, perished, but the heavens and earth which are now clearly spoken of as distinct from the former by the same word are kept in store unto fire nevertheless we according to his promise look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness that's all from second peter chapter 3 verses 5 to 13 Notwithstanding these various worlds are said to perish or pass away, this planet is the basis of all three. Passing away meaning nothing more than a change of dispensation, as is proven not only by the facts connected with the flood, but also by positive scripture testimony. At the flood the waters rose until the hills were covered, and then the mountains. And when the waters subsided, the tops of the mountains and the hills appeared again. And even the trees were not uprooted, for if they had been floating on the water, the dove could not have found rest for the sole of her foot. And when sent out the second time, she returned bearing an olive, an olive leaf rather, plucked off, so Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. If the olive tree had been floating, the plucked off leaf would have been no sign of the waters having abated. Thus it appears, there was little or no change of the earth or heavens, but simply a great destruction of life. And yet the language, taken literally, 
would imply a total annihilation of both heavens and earth. And the one that now is, is mentioned as another heaven, heavens and earth, which in turn is to pass away, not with a great flood, but with a great noise. And yet the general teaching of scripture is that the passing away of this present heavens and earth is only a change of dispensation attended with great national destruction. Thou, Lord, in the beginning thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. That being Hebrews 1, verse 10, of course, the King James Version. This is in harmony with Psalm 93, verse 1. The world is established that it cannot be moved. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease, and the earth abideth forever. And the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The former dispensation was called the old world. That is 2 Peter 2, verse 5. And this, the world that now is, and that which is to follow, the new heavens and the new earth, or world to come. The order of succession, he then illustrates to the eye with the world that was, the patriarchal world, the Jewish, the gospel, the, and then the millennial age. So the third world, that is the world to come, is the millennium and the ages beyond. There are also three subdivisions of the world that now is. For example, the patriarchal age, reaching from the flood to the death of Jacob, the Jewish age, reaching to the death of Christ, and the Gospel Age, reaching to the first resurrection and end of this world. Then follows ages to come, according to Ephesians 2, verse 7, the first of which is the Millennial Age, or rather the Age of Conquest, for in it Christ is to reign until he has subdued all enemies, and death is the last enemy that shall be conquered, that according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26. In the world that was before the flood, man was without law or national government, and the result was utter corruption. In the world that now is, a system of gradual development has obtained. Under the patriarchal age, a people were called out, after which the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Then the gospel was given, that the seed, with the great captain of our salvation, might be made perfect through suffering. And here begins one of the key concepts that will remain in place during the Russell era. The seed means one complete Christ, in other words, the head and body. He saith not unto seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ, Galatians 3, verse 16. And if ye be Christ, then ye are ye Abraham's seed, not seeds, and heirs according to the promise, according to Galatians 3, verse 29. Thus the object and work of the gospel is to perfect this seed, those who are to take the name of Christ and become one with him. And this agrees with Acts 15, verse 14. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And this is the sole object of the gospel to the Gentiles, not to convert the world, that work belongs to the millennial age. Note this is the seed of the Watchtower's idea of a paradise purgatory. But to perfect, perfect the second Adam and the second Eve, Christ and his wife. And the millennial age is introduced by the marriage of the Lamb. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. Revelation 19 verse 7. This world ends with the coming, the second coming of Christ and the resurrection of this seed. Just this number who make up the body of Christ. Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. And then it is the work of the salvation of the world begins. So it's clear just from this brief discussion of three pages that the idea of a a conclusion of the system of things as they now have it, the end of the world in this harvest period that would last until 1914 is laid out very clearly here in the 1870s, 1877 to be precise. 
that the only plan of this age is for the rescue and resurrection of the seed. This is the core of the idea that the 144,000, the chosen, the elect, must be in heaven by 1914. And of course that will continue to be the hope of that first generation of Russellites. So next time, the concept of the restitution of all things, that text from Acts chapter 3 that becomes uh, present throughout the thinking of the Russellites in their early phase as being the that much which must follow upon the end of the Gentile times in 1914. And of course that's all connected in, in Peter, that is in Acts 3, and in Russell's mind and the, his disciples' minds with the restoration of Israel, which must happen around 1914. That will develop, be developed later in the book. So next time, the restitution of all things.